8. You got to check out Bangkok Thai cuisine. It's so good. It's so good. Uh, I ate there with some with some other folks. Larry got the four star. I, n- I haven't seen him since. I don't know if that's related or connected or not, but uh, uh, great food there. Um, we are continuing our diners, drive-ins, and dives series, and we've got another gift card to give away this time to Bangkok Thai cuisine. So uh, if anyone's got a drum roll they want to give, oh, it's too late. Three five five three eight zero is the winning number. If you've got 355-380, head to the Connect table after worship. Someone will have your your gift certificate to Bangkok Thai Cuisine. $50 uh, uh, gift card, and and it's oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It is amazing. So, uh, and, and as Patch said, when people's bellies are full, they're happy. I, I hope you leave here today with a full belly, you know? Uh, and and i got to tell you, I, I've been dying to say this. I've got to say this. Flora's done a great job putting together these, uh, these Easter out reach outflow events and and just make sure you pick up some peeps for your peeps right see how I did that yeah thank you thank you very much been working on that for about a month and uh, uh, finally finally got all of the bugs hashed out of that line we are continuing diners drive-ins and dives uh, and and you know we've seen that Jesus has done a lot of ministry at the table in people's homes sometimes at the table out on the countryside with a picnic sometimes he's in someone's house and uh, and the host doesn't do a very good job of showing the hospitality but one of the other guests does sometimes he's in someone's house and and Jesus is the one showing the hospitality as a guest himself this time he's in the house and the host is going I'm not I'm not sure I should have invited him here after all given what he had to say those are some hard words that Jesus had for his host and for the host's other guests at that meal today and that's what we're talking about today hard words at the table. Um, To really kind of get our brains around what's going on here, we need to take a look at at a very contemporary, theologically significant character, Spider-Man, right? Okay, yeah, stay with me, stay with me. Don't don't turn it off just yet. Um, Spider-Man, raise your hand uh, here or online. I'm looking at the camera, so if you're online, I can see you. No, I can't. Don't freak out. I don't have access to your webcam. Um, If you've not seen Spider-Man No Way Home yet, um, Good. There's only a few people that haven't because you're about to get like spoilers out the wazoo here. So uh, it's okay. I've seen it two and a half times. It's good all two and a half times. You'll, you'll like it even if you know a little bit about what's going to happen. So in Spider-Man No Way Home, Peter Parker, his uh, Spider-Man's secret identity as Peter Parker is revealed by a nefarious bad guy who also splices together some video to make it look like Spider-Man. Peter Parker did some really, really bad things. Now everyone's mad at Spider-Man. Spider-Man, almost everyone. He's become an international person of infamy. He has lost his reputation. People think he's terrible. He can't get into MIT, and neither can his best friends get into MIT just because they're his best friends. And he is desperate to do something to make all of this go away. So he goes to his Avenger buddy, Doctor Strange, and asks the, the powerful wizard, Doctor Strange, to cast a spell that would make everyone forget that he, Peter Parker, is Spider-Man. Doctor Strange starts to cast the spell. Spider-Man thinks of, wait, there's a few people I don't want to forget. He ends up messing up the spell. It goes wrong and bad things happen. And in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when bad things happen, bad things really happen. This isn't just a spell gone wrong. This is the multiverse cracking open. And all of these bad guys from other, you know, Spider-Man villains from other universes are now coming into this Spider-Man's universe and they are confronting. You got Doc Ock, you got Electro, you got, uh, uh, Green Goblin and some others in there, and and they're all coming in. Doctor Strange, being Doctor Strange, says, this is bad. We've got to put a stop to this. Peter, you go round up all of these folks from the wrong universe, have them come here, and I'm going to send them back. Peter does that. While he's doing that, he discovers that one thing all of these bad guys have in common is that they all died in their fights against Spider-Man in their universes. And, and, and Peter's feeling kind of bad about this. He's like, I'm not sure where you should really do this. He talks to his Aunt May about it. And his Aunt May says, says, Peter, I know they've done bad things, but you've got 
a responsibility here, and it's a higher responsibility than just following the rules like Dr. Strange wants you to do. You've got a responsibility. If you can help these men change, you've got a responsibility to do that. So Peter goes back to Dr. Strange and says, we can't do this. And Dr. Strange, we have to do this. We're going to send them back. And channeling his inner Ivan Drago, he says, if they die, they die. And, and, and there's a, all of this stuff happens, which I won't go into now. But in the end, in less than 24 hours, because Spider-Man cares, because of his compassion, all of the bad guys change. It's Disney. What do you expect? And they all go back to their universes, changed people with the hope of living instead of dying. Aunt May, Aunt May had the right of it. And I think Aunt May would have loved to have been a guest at the home of that Pharisee when Jesus was delivering these lines. You know, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you experts in the law, whoa, 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 whoa. Get to see what I did there. Whoa, we got to figure out, before we really get into the meat of this, we got to figure out what's the deal with all the woes that are going on here. By the way, uh, uh, Chelsea in the back has not fallen asleep. There are no slides for this. Just listen today, kind of focus on the words, doing something something a little bit different, no extra slides. Chelsea, you can take a nap and it'll all be good. What's the deal with all the woes? I mean, Jesus sounds really mean and angry here, right? You know, he's just handing out, it's like he curse you, curse you, curse you, curse you, off with your head. He sounds like Jeffrey Baratheon or Cersei Lannister. I know I'm using lots of medium images today. That's all right. Jeffrey, you know, but that's not Jesus, right? Jesus isn't a Lannister. He's not a crazy king that's just, you know, you hurt my feelings. I'm going to make you suffer. That's not who Jesus is. What's the deal with all the woes? Well, Jesus is not Jeffrey Baratheon or Cersei Lannister. Jesus is more like Ned Stark. These woes are like Ned Stark's winter is coming. You know, winter's coming. Something bad is on the way and you got to get ready for it. It's like that, but not exactly like that. For Jesus is something really good is on the way and you better get ready for it. And it was the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Jesus for his entire earthly ministry was preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. You have to get ready to receive it and that takes repentance. You need to change how you're thinking. You need to change how you're living and orient your life and toward the kingdom, for the kingdom, or you're gonna suffer a lot. In another place, how are you suffering because of the kingdom coming? Well, it depends on where you are on this whole kingdom thing. There's another place, this time it was in the temple, it's a few chapters later in Luke where Jesus is once again hashing it out with the Pharisees, the experts in the law. This time some of the chief priests were there as well. And he's talking to them and warning them again, the kingdom is coming. And he uses a metaphor from the Old Testament. He talks about the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now in an ancient building, I don't know if this is true in current building, probably not. I don't think there is a cornerstone in my house. There's a corner poured concrete. It's a different thing. The cornerstone was the most important stone in the building. The cornerstone was placed. And if it was right and it was square and it was true and it was placed where it was supposed to be, then everything else would be oriented around it and the whole building would be right and square and true. If it was off, if it was out of square, if it was untrue, if it was wrongly placed, the whole building is going to be off, out of square and wrongly placed. Okay? And Jesus said, he used this metaphor, that the stone that the builders rejected, the experts rejected the stone, it's now the cornerstone. And it's clear from the metaphor that Jesus is saying, I'm that stone. I'm that stone. I'm bringing in the kingdom. and I'm, I'm the cornerstone. I'm, everything needs to be oriented around me. The stone that the builders rejected. And then he says this, those that fall on that stone will be broken to pieces. Those upon whom that stone falls will be crushed. That word crushed is interesting there. This is really the only place in the Bible where it's translated crushed. Everywhere else that it's used, it's translated scattered. It's used a lot in images of winnowing, doing a lot of ancient or, or you know, different kind of metaphors today. Winnowing was the process when you took the grain, let's use wheat for example, it's harvested. The wheat seed, which gets ground into flour to make bread, has a husk around it. The husk is worthless, it can't be used for anything. But the husk is really light, the seed 
seed is heavy. So they would toss the seed in the air and the wind would blow the waste, the husks away and the seeds would fall in a pile. That wind, the word that used for the husks being blown away, scattered by the wind is the same word that Jesus used here for what happens when that stone falls on you. You're going to be crushed. You're going to be blown away by the wind. And not the good kind of blown away. Whoa, I was so blown away by Jesus in the kingdom of God. Not that kind of blown away. It's like you're gone. You're just out of the picture. You're scattered. You're dust in the wind. Never to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom because you're out. You're crushed in the dust and you're scattered by the wind. The kingdom is coming, Jesus says. And if you stand in the way of the kingdom, if you oppose the kingdom, whatever your reasons for opposing it might be, even if you think you're doing God's will, this can't be the kingdom because the wrong sorts of people are in it, I must oppose it. You're going to get crushed by the kingdom and scattered and out. And that's the warning Jesus is giving. He's telling the Pharisees, he's telling the Bible scholars, the, the legal experts here, this is the stuff that's getting blown away. This is the stuff that's out. This is the stuff that's crushed and scattered and there's no place in the kingdom for it. And here are the things that remain, that abide, that will have a place in the kingdom. What are those things? The first things that will be crushed and scattered are greed and wickedness. Jesus said, now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. The Pharisees were real good at being presentable, but inside is greed and wickedness. And Jesus is like, there's no place in the kingdom for greed and wickedness. Can, can we agree with that? Anybody here want greed and wickedness in the kingdom of God? The kingdom of heaven, that's the, the, the havoc that has been wreaked upon human lives in this world because of greed and wickedness. We don't want that in the kingdom. God doesn't want that in the kingdom. Something like 20,000 children a day die from starvation and treatable illness in this world now. Now, do the math. You can figure out how many die during this sermon. That sounds gruesome and morbid, and it's true. And it's starving. We throw away enough food in this country to feed everyone in the world. We spend enough on scents, perfumes, fragrances, colognes. We spend enough on that to feed everyone in the world. Everyone. And treatable, not, not untreatable diseases, treatable diseases. 20,000 children a day. Do we want that in the kingdom? Clearly God does not want that in the kingdom. I don't think any of us wants that in the kingdom. And Jesus says greed and wickedness, no matter how you look on the outside, if that's how you are on the inside, greed and wickedness crushed and scattered Next thing that's crushed and scattered, strict observance of rules divorced from the ju justice and love of God are scattered and crushed. Jesus said, woe to you because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the former, Jesus said. It's good that you're tithing but you've neglected the latter, justice and the love of God. A strict observance of the law, even a strict observance of the law of God, law handed down by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, even strict observance of that, divorced from justice and the love of God, gets scattered, gets crushed, is excluded from the kingdom. Strict observance of the rules doesn't save anyone. And strict enforcing of the rules doesn't save anyone. In fact, strict observance and strict enforcement of the rules, you know, when a group of people decides that we're the morality police, we're going to make sure everyone else is thinking and acting rightly and properly, and if they don't, we're going to cancel them or everything they've done or everything, you know, that doesn't save anybody. That doesn't save anybody. 
when it's divorced from justice and the love of God. What else is crushed and scattered? Status-seeking pride and vanity. Jesus said, woe to you because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. You love to be honored. You love to be lifted up. You love to be admired and respected. You got all of these likes. You've got all of these followers. You got all of this going on. You're a social influencer. People just listen to you and they admire you. They want to dress like you. They want to act. They want you to like and retweet their stuff so other people will like and retweet them as well. Jesus said, no, that's not what life is about. There's no place for social status seeking in the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus said, who said who's greater? The one who's at the table or the one who's serving the food and cleaning up afterwards? Jesus answered, the one who's at the table. And then he said, but I'm here among you as one who serves. If the Lord and Savior of the world, if the King of the universe says, I'm the server, I'm the waitress, I'm the busboy, and we're out there saying, no, 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 I want a nice seat at the table. In fact, not just any table, I want a head table. I want to be as close to the, to the center as possible. I want the spotlight on me. All of that crushed and scattered, crushed and scattered. Hypocrisy is crushed and scattered. That obsession with external appearances, external appearances count for nothing. It's what's in your heart that matters. You're like unmarked graves, Jesus said which people walk over without knowing it. Walking over a grave made a person unclean in that culture, in that mindset. It, it disqualified them from entering into the, near the presence of God at the temple, disqualified them from worship. And Jesus said to these experts in the law, these Bible scholars and religious leaders, and he said to them, you know what? You're like hidden graves. You're walking around with dead people's bones inside of you, and you're, you think you're doing people a favor just by being willing to speak your truth to them, but you're really corrupting them and defiling them, and you're not aware of it, and they're not aware of it. You're dragging them down. You're not lifting them up, and they don't even know it, and you don't know it. This... this attending to the outside without dealing with the inside. There's no place for that in the kingdom. No place at all. So what is preserved then? What, what is the seed that falls to the ground? What stays and abides in the kingdom? Jesus said this, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. You're trying so hard to look good on the outside. If you're generous to the poor, everything else will take care of itself. Generosity, care, compassion, concern for the poor, for those who have less, for those in desperate need, that's what will make you clean. It's not whether people admire you and respect you and what kind of salary you make and where you live and how many followers you have. It's how you use your possessions to care for those who have less. That's what makes you clean. That's what will lead you to clean. That abides. That's what makes it into the kingdom. And he said, yeah, follow the law. Follow the directions God has given you. But don't neglect justice and the love of God. Justice, a pursuit of justice, true justice, true justice and the love of God, these things abide. Yeah, Peter Parker sorted that out with his Aunt May. There are other literary figures that have done that too, like Jean Valjean. Right? Right? Now someone out there is going, he put Spider-Man in the same category as Jean Valjean. <gasps> it's all right. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. Jean Valjean from Les Mis, you know, he, he, was, he was an ex-con. He'd done awful things while he was in prison, did awful things after he got out of prison. He was crushed by an unjust legal system, and his response to that was to become an unjust person who did awful things to other people. But the bishop showed him compassion and love and treated him justly. 
and his life was transformed and he pursued justice and compassion and the love of God in his life. And then there was Javert, the prison guard turned policeman that was obsessed with putting Jean Valjean back in jail. A person like that has no place in society. A person like that has no right to be among good people. A person like that can't be in the kingdom. They need to be in prison. They need to be on the rack. They need to be suffering for the things they've done wrong. This is the image of the Pharisees. This is the image, Jean Valjean, the image of Jesus, the bishop, the image of Jesus in this story. And it's easy to root against the Pharisees when we think of them like Javert. It's easy to root against Javert because Jean Valjean becomes such a wonderful person and Javert tries to make him suffer. It's easy to root for Valjean, easy to root against Javert. And so it's easy to root for Jesus and easy to root against the Pharisees and the religious law experts. It's easy. It's easy when we think of Jesus agreeing with us and us disagreeing with the Pharisees. It's also easy when you're dealing with fictional characters. Valjean, Javert, Spider-Man, Doc Ock, Electro, these are all fictional. Derek, Derek Black is not fictional. And Matthew Stevenson is not fictional. Let me tell you about Derek first. Derek, and, and uh, at the time of the events I'll be describing, Derek was in college. Um, and he had kept his true identity hidden, much like Spider-Man, only not so much a good guy. Derek Black was a very proud, confident, educated white nationalist. His father had been a grand wizard in the Ku Klux Klan. His father started the Stormfront website to which Derek contributed often. He had his own radio show where he uh, uh, strongly advocated for his white nationalist viewpoints. He had a blog where he said awful things about people of color and Jewish people and immigrants. And, and Derek kept all of that hidden when he went to New College. He had grown up homeschooled. He had spent the vast majority of his time around people that looked like him, thought like him, and acted like him. When he got to college, he just wanted to be one of the folks. He, didn't, he figured, you know, hey, I'm a white nationalist, probably wasn't going to win him any friends. And he was right. And he kept it hidden, and he was well-liked. He was not Mr. Popularity. He was kind of a quiet kid. He got along well with... Uh, Matthew Stevenson, devout, practicing Jewish person. This will blow your mind. They used to sit on the main square of the campus and sing country western songs together. Go figure. He got along with a lot of folks. And then he went away to Europe to study for a year. And while he was gone, someone found out at the college who he really was. And they started posting about it on the college's social media website. And within days, thousands of posts appeared, reviling Derek, calling for his expulsion, expressing fear at what his presence on campus might mean. Was he going to bring other people that believed like him and do something awful on the campus? Was it even safe to go there anymore? Outrage, anger, frustration, fear, and exclusion. The school declined to expel Derek, and so the students decided they would just shun him instead, and they did. He moved off campus. When he was on campus, people wouldn't talk to him. He would, occasion he would often get verbally assaulted, very occasionally had some minor physical assaults. Mostly they physically left him alone, but he was definitely excluded. That was Derek. Matthew. Stevenson was a devout and practicing Jewish man, deeply committed to his faith. And, and he had started in his freshman year a weekly Shabbat meal in his dorm room. And he invited everybody. He invited everybody. There were, there were Jews that came. There were Christians that came. There were atheists. There were straight people. There were gay people. There were men. There were women. They would come and hang out and, and, and just have a good time sharing a meal together. Matthew would, would speak some Hebrew blessings over the meal. At the end, the folks that were not practicing Jews would go off and party someplace else. And the folks that, that didn't want to do that would stay, uh, sometimes through the night in the darkness, because Matthew was so committed and, and was that level of observant, he wouldn't even use electricity on the Sabbath. So they would sit in the dark and talk into the small hours of the morning. 
Derek was one of the folks that went to the meal every week. Go figure. And when everyone else was excluding, as Derek was coming back to campus the following semester, Matthew had a different idea. See, Matthew had experienced his own exclusion at New College. He'd experienced enough shaming to know that being excluded only reinforced the divides that were already there. You see, Matthew was an observant Jew among atheists. He was a political conservative in a place of radical liberals. He was an aspiring hedge fund manager in, in, on a campus of, of rabid anti-capitalists. The previous year, while his freshman roommate plotted radical protests and composted dinner leftovers in their communal bathroom, Matthew uh, formed the college's first finance club and invited a speaker to campus to talk about Wall Street investing. That particular activity resulted in more than one ethnic slur being directed toward Matthew. And he knew that all that did was make him more committed to what he was doing. He immediately started planning a speaker for the next semester. So he knew that excluding Derek would only reinforce Derek and his existing beliefs. And so he had a plan. He was just going to invite him back to Shabbat dinner. And he did. And when other folks that came to that dinner found out that Derek was coming, they said, no thanks, I'm out. Mostly the white students. So no thanks, I'm out. Uh, they did not want to implicitly endorse Derek. Some of them, they were afraid that if they ate dinner with him, that they would be saying just what we've talked about, what Jesus did when he went to eat with someone. He said, these folks are my folks. They said, we don't want to say that about Derek. We don't want to endorse him in any way, shape, or form. Even implicitly, we're not coming. Others were afraid of what he might say or what he might do, given the beliefs he practiced and espoused online and in his life outside of school. And so they didn't come. But Matthew invited him. And, and the two other people that came were his Jewish friend Moshe and their immigrant friend Juan. And they joked together about, you know, what a great headline it would make. Two Jews and an immigrant invite a white supremacist to dinner. Film at 11. And, and they decided up front, we're not going to talk about white supremacy, white nationalism, any of those things. We're just going to be his friend. And Matthew said the goal, his goal, was to make Jews human to Derek. They did that. And it didn't happen overnight. But it did happen. And Derek eventually changed. And he repented. And he was broken. And now Derek condemns what he used to believe and openly acknowledges that he was wrong, that his family was wrong. And he works as an anti-racist and resists white supremacy and white nationalism. And he's still excluded and shunned, but now he's excluded and shunned by his family and by his former friends. You see, Jesus pointed out to the religious leaders, the biblical scholars, that there is a key to the knowledge that's contained in the Scripture. There's a key to that. And Jesus said to them, you've lost the key. And you've locked the doors. You can't get in. And you're keeping other people from getting in. And the key, see, that would have baffled them because they were experts. They knew the Bible better than anyone else. They could quote it chapter and verse, and they knew all the commentaries too, and they could quote them author and line. But they didn't understand it. The meaning was locked. The mystery was shut to them because they'd lost the key, and the key is what Jesus was trying to get them to see. It was love of God and compassion and a fierce pursuit of justice. And that's, that's what Matthew had. 
and it unlocked the door for Derek. I'm gonna go just a couple of minutes over again here. I gotta say, and it wouldn't be fair, I would be misleading you if I said it was just the dinner groups alone that helped Derek change. There was another person that was involved. Her name was Allison. She had been good friends with Derek before she knew what he was and who he was. When she found out, she withdrew. She wanted to confirm. She wanted to make sure, is this really, you really believe this stuff? He's like, yeah, I do. He's like, okay, we're done. And she quit coming to the Shabbat meals. She wouldn't go back at first. But eventually she did go back and, and was a friend to him too. But outside of those Shabbat meals, outside of the dinner conversation, she pushed Derek on his beliefs. She challenged him. She confronted him. She discussed with him in person, online, and other. She didn't get on the forums and do it there. She did it directly with him, pushing and challenging, speaking truth into his things that he believed that were lies and deceptions. And it was the combination of those things that led Derek to change. It was those weekly meals where he had a community, where he belonged, where he was loved and accepted and received by people that he really before hadn't even thought of as real people. But they loved him and they accepted him and they received him. And that compassion, that love, that justice opened the door so when Allison and other places spoke directly to him and challenged him, he could hear and receive that truth. He ignored all the posts. He did what every parent wishes their teenager would do. Ignore what people are saying about you online. Please, Derek did that. He didn't hear any of those things. But he listened to his friends who loved him. And he changed. It was the justice, it was the compassion, it was the love that unlocked the door so that Derek could see the truth. I want to go back to that stone for one more moment. And this, I'm wrapping it up with this. There were two ways to be broken on that stone. Jesus said, if this stone falls on you, it will crush you into powder. You will be scattered by the wind. Or you can fall on this stone and be broken to pieces. That word fall in the Greek that he used, you know what it means? It means, it means fall. It was used for rain falling from the sky. It was used for the sower when he scattered the seed and it fell on the ground. It was also used repeatedly in the Gospels when people fell at the feet of Jesus and worship and praise. And invariably the people that did that were broken like Jairus, whose daughter was dying and he couldn't do anything to save her. See, we can stand against what Jesus is doing and what Jesus is bringing and saying, Jesus, if those people are in, I'm out. I don't want any. In fact, if those people are in, you're probably not really God in the flesh anyway. You're probably not the son of God. I don't want anything to do with this. We can stand in opposition to that and be crushed by the movement of the Spirit as the wind of the Spirit passes over. Or we can fall on the stone and be broken and acknowledge our brokenness and ask forgiveness and receive mercy and compassion and justice. And what opens the door for that is the compassion and the mercy and the justice that comes not just from the mouth of Jesus because it did come from the mouth of Jesus, but also comes from the mouth and the hands of the people who say they are his followers. Are we showing love? Are we showing compassion? Are we showing justice? Are we welcoming and receiving not just the people we agree with, but even the people that we radically disagree with, even the people that we know that what they believe is wrong because what Derek believed was wrong. And we can be the morality police and stand back and judge and condemn and exclude and cut out and cancel, or we can say, let's sit down and talk about it. Why don't you come to my house? 
In fact, we won't even talk about it. We'll talk about the Browns. <laughs> That's controversial too. Uh, we'll talk about the calves. We'll talk about the weather. We'll talk about what's going on with our kids. This is the purpose of microchurch. I've done a lot of inviting on that. Microchurch is not a 10-week thing that's done and then you're out. It's ongoing. Uh, you can step in or out at any time. You can step in now and go on the website. Plenty of opportunities. And be a part, whether you do it with microchurch or not, be a part of this receiving with compassion and justice and the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen.